And I field a lot of questions from clients around, you know, what they hear that increasing protein intake can have adverse effects on longevity. We see some of the work from Walter Longo and colleagues uh, in animal models and some observational work. Do you maybe describe to folks what the rationale would be for kind of lowering protein from those camps and what the strength of that evidence is at this point? The theory, or so it goes anyway, is that um, if you ingest protein, there's an association with uh, rises in a hormone called insulin-like growth factor one. And uh, IGF-1 is a pro-growth factor, and it's associated sort of, you know, uh, I'll, I'll call it a cousin, which is growth hormone as well, um, are these pro-growth factors. And, and the, the theory is, at least, is that chronically increased levels of these hormones could drive cellular growth in, um, you know, cellular growth, you think, oh, that's not too bad, but uncontrolled cellular growth is, is cancer, right? And so Walter Longo and several others would sort of point to uh, their very well done, like the science is immaculate, I can't touch it, but that's in some really interesting models. And I would say sort of mouse models and a few other things that uh, shows that uh, these mice on higher protein diets do have increased rates of cancer. And then, so they don't live as long. And then you get some of the human observational data. And here's where, you know, to me, if you do a really deep look into the human data, it's actually fairly varied. And so I don't know that there's a consistent pattern associating higher protein intakes with shorter lifespan then it gets really gray and you have to, I think, take a little bit of a leap of faith to say that it's an applicable uh, hypothesis to human beings. Yeah. I mean, it seems interesting on the sort of practical front when we look at obviously some of your work and Theo Spoglu and this idea that, you know, the current RDA for protein only being 0.8 grams per kilo, as we look towards longevity, we're seeing benefits towards that 1.2 grams per kilogram. And and maintaining muscle mass and supporting longevity. And so those two things obviously seem to be at odds in the sense of if we're going to increase protein intake to protect muscle and, and bone, then, then that's going to support longevity. Then, you know, making sense of those two directions, could you shed some light on, uh, you know, that, that suggestion around increasing to that 1.2 and some of the work you've done there? Yeah, I mean, I, I think one of the, the, you know, the practical sort of take home messages around, you know, it's not just our work. And I mean, it's lots of people in the sort of protein field who would argue mm-hmm. that particularly as you get older, and even the Longo data supports this, is that your requirements for protein actually go up. So there's this condition that we call anabolic resistance that sets in as you get a little bit older, where you don't get the same anabolic effect with uh, protein ingestion that you did when you were younger. Mm-hmm. Um, lots of reasons why that's the case, but that may be one of the key reasons why you need a little bit more protein. So the system gets a little bit less sensitive and you need a a greater stimulus, so more protein. And as you point out, that's associated with uh, greater muscle mass, it's associated with improved muscle function, uh, activities of daily living are even improved in those situations. You get less fractures, lots of other things that sort of, you know, are contrary to the idea that lower protein would allow you to, to live longer. And, you know, my, my, my take on a, a lot of the animal models, which, you know, it's very elegant science and it's very mechanistically revealing is that these animals are, are what we call inbred uh, as opposed to humans who are outbred, like we're, yeah. you know, <laughs> so we're a little different. Yeah. And we're not kept in sort of a very sealed, contained, you know, pathogen and 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 now virus, right? You know, so stress pathogen. free, I guess. <laughs> yeah, stress free. And I think that you know these sort of stressful periods of disease or or like disuse, hospitalization, are are just not things that are experienced by these animals in cages. And so that's to me at least where there's a big dissociation between the animal models and the human condition. And so. You think about those stress points and, and for an older person, th- those are true watershed moments. They can lose a lot of muscle. They go downhill really quickly and they don't get it back. And so, you know, our theory at least is that these, these disuse events, these disease events, et cetera, are uh, critical points in an older person's life. And, you know, the mice in a cage just, just don't have anything like that. Yeah, I mean, it's, it's something that I experienced firsthand. I and mean, my dad, when he was in his mid 70s, he went out west to visit my sister and caught a bad cold. And then all of a sudden, he's coming back 
off the plane in a wheelchair. He looks like he's lost 10 or 12 pounds. He's spending a week in the emergency room and they can't figure out how to keep his electrolytes on point. Yep. And so that sort of starting of that sarcopenia that was really became accelerated and, and was not in a good way for a period of time. And yeah. And the challenge at that age, especially with the clients I see is around, they need a greater dose as you're suggesting there, but then the appetite's lower. And so, you know, so what are some of the strategies there? Is this where, you know, using some portable nutrition or some supplements can be helpful or how can we get some of these boluses that, you know, 65, 70 plus are going to need to be able to stimulate? Yeah, great point. Yeah. You know, the scenario you painted with you, with your dad is, is not uncommon. And, you know, I saw it in, in, in my dad as well, particularly, you know, as he sort of went downhill with chronic heart failure that he did less and then he did less and, and you know, and, and it yeah, just becomes just a big spiral. Downward spiral, yeah. Exactly. So the the point seems to be, as you say, is that uh, you know you're, you're you're trying to preach get more protein, eat more, and yet your appetite is down. So you know how do we counteract this? And so we begin to hone in on some of the sort of key ingredients, and in and you know a key amino acid uh, is leucine. So out of all the twenty amino acids, of the building blocks of protein this one amino acid is sort of the trigger amino acid. In other words, it, it really switches on muscle protein synthesis. And so we've tried enriching lower doses of protein with leucine to see if we could uh, trigger a greater anabolic response. And indeed we, we, we do see that. And that's led to a couple of uh, innovations in sort of, you know, some patents around leucine enriched protein bars, leucine enriched, uh, ready to drinks and that sort of thing. So, you know, and there are several companies out there that are pursuing similar things. So the Nestle's and Danone's of the world have, um, supplements that are, that are simply, you know, a little bit higher in some of these, uh, amino acids and leucine in particular. So, yeah, I do think that there's, there's room for that, you know, food first, obviously, if you can do it. Uh, but if the volume of food, uh, is tough, um, then I, I think supplements are a good alternative for older people. Yeah, it's interesting. If you don't work with that population, you sort of don't realize that even dentition plays a role of just being able oh, to yeah. select a protein source that they can actually yeah. chew and it is comfortable with. And, you know, so for me as a practitioner, trying to establish some of these habits when we're 30, 40, 50, in terms of ensuring protein intake helps a lot so that by the time we're 60, 70, 80, it just becomes second nature and it's just how you eat. Yeah. Um, you know, you recently completed this systematic review and meta-analysis around supporting muscle mass and function in, in healthy adults. Often think about these different points. Again, it's kind of 1.2. And I, you know, I had Rob Morton on a couple of years back around the 1.6 gram grams per kilo. Yeah. You know, is is that more of the sweet spot when we're looking to kind of make further progress on, on the muscle mass front? Yeah, I mean, uh, you know, just to be really clear, the writer statement is that the recommended dietary allowance um, sits at 0.8 grams of protein per kilo per day. And, and, you know, it was it's a semantic argument, but I would actually be I don't think that's going to change, but I, its name needs to change. So it needs to be called the MDI, which is the minimal dietary intake in, in my yeah. estimation. So first, it's not recommended. <laughs> and it's you could you're allowed Survival. to have more. So when you say it's the recommended dietary allowance, I'm like, you know, that's it's just the wrong name, but it's yeah. it's never gonna change. Like I've been doing this for 20 plus years and I don't see any any signs that it's gonna change. So if, if we just renamed it and, and then I, I actually that's that's great. Uh, so let's let's work from there, which is yeah. sort of the bottom line, and go upwards. And so yeah, I think uh, you know, the closer you can get older people on a daily basis to about 1.2. Uh, I think things are, you know, going to work out a little bit better when you're in sort of these stress states. And that's sort of what athletics is, you know, uh, people who are training heavy or that's a state of constant stress. And, and it's the repair of the stress and the recovery where obviously the gains are made. And then I think there's reason to go up as high as 1.6 so that, you know, that's, that's twice the recommended dietary allowance. And, yeah, I know a lot of people go, oh, you know, I have athletes consuming more than that. And my, my point is, you know, for sure, you know, you, there are people on two and three and sometimes four times that sort of intake. And, you know, it's not that you can't eat it and it's not that your body won't even digest it. It's that your body can't actually use it. 